Well, it's processing day here at Blue Belly Acres and kind of walk through the process of getting set up for processing. We are in the middle of winter and it is, I think like 33 degrees out here, maybe a little bit warmer. So it's just actually about perfect for processing. We have uh, the animal that we're doing a pig today uh, in the cooler. So we're ready, we've already done one and get ready to move on to the second one. But I want to kind of talk about what do you think about before you go into the whole process of doing your cuts and getting it ready for the freezer. So I got some notes here. I kind of want to go through them. These are going to be in absolutely no particular order. If I jump around a little bit, I'll try to do my best to stay on point. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was tables. You want to make for sure that you have a lot of table surfaces because you want your tools. Not all of these are going to stay on here, but particularly the ones that you're going to be using a lot but you want your tools, you want all your equipment and the animal to be able to have plenty of room. Just because they are big and heavy, the animals can be, even after you get them broke down into the primals. So if you don't have a table this size, have a secondary table, maybe even a third table, have a cooler ready. So how we do it is we take the animal, we break it into primals, and then we put the primals back into the cooler. The coolers are filled with ice, we really don't need the ice right now just because it's so cold. But we go ahead and put the primals into the freezer or in the coolers and then pull them out as we're doing the individual cuts. So tables, you want something, this is a plastic type, this is okay. I've seen people with butcher block that's actually good if you have a butcher block that's actually big enough. Stainless steel would be another good option. And you will notice that I'm sitting, uh, this is a long process, especially if you're doing multiples. So you want to be able to be comfortable because it, especially like I'm not getting any younger. If you hurt your back, then it's going to be a long, slow day. And trust me, it's a long, slow day, even if you don't hurt your back. So I like a nice regular size table. And then I just have a little swivel chair that I get to sit on. And if I need to, I can stand up and move, move things. Um, ice. Obviously, I guess that goes without saying. Uh, saw. Okay, so this is a lot of debate. So there's a few different ways that when you're going to have to break through bones. A particular like today for us, we're going through a pig. So if you're cutting through like let's say a shank or even worse, if you're going through the chine bone, which is basically the spine, and you're cutting the the loin and the back ribs or baby backs, which they're kind of called. You can go with something like that, but let me tell you, that's going to be a long, arduous cut. It's not going to be straight. It's going to be painful. Um, this is more of a filled saw, in my opinion. I would not ever use that in the processing room or doing processes. You can actually go with something like this. This is a sawzall. This is a DeWalt sawzall. You can actually use this. Now, interesting fact, because some of you might be like, okay, that's really disgusting because that's something you use for woodworking. This is actually USDA approved. Uh, I've actually been to butcher shops where they have actually used literally this one. And I'll link to some, the link below. This is basically a sawzall system motor has been turned sideways. So as long as you are using a stainless steel blade, that's how you get away with it. Um, so a little, another little hack on that is if you take and stick a Ziploc bag over the sawzall before you put the blade in, that'll keep this uh, from the meat or your bone dust, all that kind of stuff from getting into the saw. So that is a good option. Now, this is obviously much faster. I will give you some of the cons with it, I guess, as, as, far, as far as the pros, obviously it being faster, less energy. If you don't have a way of hanging your animal, if it's a, a pig or a cow or something larger, maybe a, a goat, it's very challenging because you're trying to hold the meat and you're trying to cut it and you're trying to hold this. So you need some way of suspending it. So I have this if, if there's a particular cut that I have to get through, but I'll be honest with you, this is actually my preferred option. Again, uh, basically a hacksaw with a stainless steel blade. Uh, I believe this is a limb. Um, I'll try to put links to all this stuff with a 
um, Amazon link in the thing below. This is probably your best bet. Now, if you have a long saw like this, use the whole blade as much as you can. It, again, can get challenging because you're trying to drag the whole cut across there and it's gonna cut catch on the bone fragments and stuff like that. The smaller ones are better for control. They don't kind of get offline. Uh, for what we do, mainly we, we don't do a whole lot of cuts. We do some for some friends and family and then obviously we do our own. So if my spare ribs aren't exactly straight, I'm not really broken hearted about it. We have the larger one, so that is probably the one that I would use for us personally. But again, if you have a smaller one, just get you a stainless steel blade. That'll work perfect. Saws, okay, knives. So I've actually talked about this set in particular. Uh, I, I like this set. This is an outdoor edge. None of these are gonna be perfect unless you're getting up into the really, really expensive uh, sets. Now the funny thing is you buy all these knives and realistically, I use two. Um, I have a fillet knife in this set, but truth be told, this is my old trusty, this is a Kingfisher, this is actually a, a fish fillet knife. I love this knife and this is actually the one that I use. The wood does get a little slick, particularly with pork because you're gonna have a lot of fat on your hands. So this, it, you want to make for sure that if you get two knives and two knives only, get your fillet knife and get you a good butcher knife. This is going to be for your big cuts. And I would say probably 90% of the time, this is what you're going to end up using is your fillet knives. That's how you're going to cut your pork chops, fillet off your, your pork bellies or whatever animal you're doing, if you're doing chickens or whatever. Now with these, I've seen people use a steel, and I think that that's wise. This is a really nice steel. This is in between your cuts. You can get that that just basically kind of hones the blade just a little bit. So you wanna you wanna be able to use this and, and kind of it's not gonna be in this video, but figure out how to use it to make for sure that you have a good edge on your knife. But this little thing, okay? I've seen. In fact, I've got a few of them. There's one that actually comes in this kit with the outdoor edge. Basically, it's the exact same thing. This is a <laughs> It's a cheater way of putting a good edge or a decent edge on your knife. Um, if, you just need, if you're just finding it's not cutting, get you something like this. It's got the finger guards. This one's more solid. Um, this one's a little bit softer, but it's still, and essentially all you're doing is you're just, you're just dragging your knife down. You don't have to put a whole lot of pressure on it. Um, and that's gonna put a really nice edge. Be careful if you don't put this, that you're not doing this over your meat or you will find that you're gonna have little metal chunks in your cuts. But if I had these three in a saw, I could pretty much cut up a whole animal regardless. Now when you get into the other things, Skinner, this is obviously for the pre-process, um, when you're gutting, all that kind of stuff. Rectal cavity puller, I don't have one of those here. That might be another good one depending upon the animal, just it helps to keep the meat clean because as I'm sure just thinking it through, keeping the animal clean is extremely, extremely important. Botulism is a real thing. And while some people inject it in their face to make themselves look younger, it's not good if it gets in your gut, it will kill you. Another thing is a bone brush. Now, whenever you get done sawing, you're gonna have a whole bunch of bone dust and a bone brush, basically it's, this is made out of plastic and this, this is not hard at all, but it will scrape across the meat uh, it will get all of the bone chunks off of the meat. Uh, again, you, nobody wants to be eating a pork chop and you know have a have a bit of bone get stuck in their teeth. So this is good. You just scrape this off and then flick it into your yuck bucket uh, trash, basically. And then since we're talking about yuck buckets, I'll kind of touch on that here for a moment. So I actually have uh, multiple buckets here. So for like the where I break down the primals. <coughs> Then I'll stick those back to the back of the cooler. I'll stage them if I have Lynn actually packaging. Normally she does that inside, mainly because it's 30 degrees out here. So she's the smart one of the two. But I've got a yuck bucket over here. Essentially all it is, is it's a trash can. So if I have bone chunks or whatever, I throw it in there and I make for sure that I know which one that is. If there's a bit of hair, if there's something here, I'm gonna throw that in there because I, I need to, especially if it's warmer, if you're processing 
and where it's not 30 degrees outside or 30 degrees in your, your wherever you're processing, you need to stick this in the freezer because you don't want it to go bad. You want it to attract animals and I need to get that to the dump or take care of this as quick as possible. So I have a yuck bucket here. I have some, I have another bucket, it's just a five gallon bucket and I'm gonna put maybe some of the more interesting pieces that maybe like if a friend or family is having me do it, they might want the neck bone. Some people do, they'll smoke them up and it's a great seasoning for soups, the, the neck bone is, particularly with a pig. But some people are like, no, nah, that's just way too much work. Okay, well, it's not gonna go there. Either we're gonna use it, roast it up, and turn it into bone broth, or it's gonna go into the yuck buckets. Uh, we need to make for sure that we know exactly where all of our stuff is. I also have another bucket down here, again, particularly with pork, that is my sausage bucket. So as I'm cutting stuff up, or if I'm squaring up an end, then any of that excess stuff is not gonna go in the yuck bucket, it's gonna go in the sausage bucket, and we'll take that in and grind it. Gloves. So one of the things that I don't do that I really should do, and I would highly recommend that you do it, and it will be something that we add to our repertoire, but if you're in a home setting or processing or anything, like you, you can't just go out and buy everything. It can get really, really expensive. So, and granted this is a small thing, but it's a chainmail glove. I can't recommend it enough because I can't tell you how many times I've come close to cutting myself really bad. So a chainmail glove is actually something really good to have. It wouldn't be, so I'm right-handed, so my knife is gonna be in my right hand, so my chainmail glove. So oftentimes you're cutting and you'll find that if you're moving toward your hand, it's probably a good idea to have a chainmail glove. However, even if you don't have that, get these, okay? This isn't gonna really protect your hand, but it is gonna keep some of the fat and the stuff off of your hands, again, cleanliness is so stinking important. In fact, I even have a bottle of cleaner that in between like primals and whatnot, I will spray down, spray my uh, instruments down. Sometimes I'll take them in and actually have a coffee break, clean, clean my knives, clean up everything and kind of reset uh, both my staging area and my brain. Lighting, I actually have an LED light that uh, not only do I have the overhead lights, but you want as much light as possible on the animals as you're cutting it up. You wanna make for sure that you can see things, uh, whether it be glands that you need to cut out. If the lighting is not good, you're not going to see them. If there's any blood, coagulated blood, you wanna be able to get that and kind of get that into your yuck bucket. Lighting is extremely important. I will say another thing, because my daughter would probably tell me this, is uh, yeah, I probably need to have some type of netting for my hair. Obviously, if we were a USDA farm, which we are not, um, then that would be a requirement, both for my hair and my beard. All right, the last few things, it's gonna be basically the next staging area from here. But before I move on, I do wanna ask just a big favor. If you can, if you're getting some value out of this, just please, Give me a like, subscribe, and if you get a chance, actually leave a comment down below. Am I, am I missing something? Because maybe you might be doing something in your process that I'm not even thinking about. The last station before it goes into the freezer camp is packaging. Now we vacuum seal everything that we can. Obviously like with a, a pig, a ham is not going to fit into your typical vacuum seal. So we do the flash boil, a lot of people use them for their chickens. We just get the water at a certain temperature, I think it's like 180, 190 degrees. You put it in there, you, you do the little tie, you dip it down in the boiling water, shrink wraps on there. We double bag our hams just because they're so big. The pork butts, typically in the, um, both the picnic and the Boston's, we have to do the same way. Everything else, pretty much we can get it into a Ziploc bag. So we have two different vacuum sewers. Uh, we're trying out a V-Bore right now, kind of the chamber vacuum. Something tells me that's gonna be a purchase here before too long, because I think it's gonna be pretty nice. But you want the packaging, you want all that to be staged. So she's actually inside, again, she's the smart one. So she's in where it's warm. She has all of that kind of stuff set up. She has the vacuum sewer. She has labels already printed out. 
if you process the pig, even if you have it, you can get online and figure out what all cuts you're gonna have. You know there's gonna be pork chop, sausage, all that kind of stuff. Think through it and actually print you off some labels. Nobody wants to be digging through the freezer and find a package that doesn't have any labeling on it whatsoever. And you're like, is this pork? Is this deer? Is this rabbit? Is it chicken? Is it, you know, so get you some nice labels, even if it's not like fancy labels with your logo on it or anything. But get you some nice labels that are designed for the freezer so that you can just smack them on the packaging. When you stick it in the freezer, you'll be able to know what it is. Now with that, another thing that we like to do is we have scales in there. So particularly like with sausage or whatever, or if it's say a Boston butt. When we put the Boston butt in, we actually weigh it because when you're gonna cook, what's the first thing the recipe is gonna call for? What's the weight so that you know how long to set it at whatever temperature? So we put the weight of all of our packages on the label and that's obviously written in. So you're gonna to need to have you a decent set of scales as well in the process to kind of go through that. Processing day is physically exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting. Do as much as you can to get yourself all set up. Hopefully this helps you, gives you some things to think about as you're going into processing season, regardless of what animal it is or what season of the year it is. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us. Till next time. See you.